All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, and welcome to the Uses of Philosophy for Living, the End of History. Ha <laughs> ha. So I, um, I was going to do courage this month. I've moved courage to next month because I've received many, many requests to say something about our current state of affairs. Uh, people keep saying, you know, what is the philosophical response. Of course, there is never a philosophical response that would be unphilosophical. There's always many philosophical responses. But I thought it, that seems a reasonable question. How do, we, how do we deploy philosophy in the times we find ourselves in? So I want to start with the concept from Hegel called the end of history. <clears throat> and Hegel argued roughly uh, that history is going someplace. It's going to the perfect state. And when the perfect state is achieved, then history stops. There's no further development. Events happen, but history in the sense of an unfolding of a greater plan or organization or greater perfection <clears throat> comes to a halt. Now, there's a lot of weaknesses in this argument, and, and, and this was evident even when Hegel made it, but he's also making some larger points. <clears throat> but later, um, in the being much later, over 100 years later, Francis Fukuyama, an American thinker, took this idea and pretty much literalized it. And I want to read a long quote <clears throat> from Francis Fukuyama because he really summarizes the concept. And the notion, I think, is that we believe this concept, or we have believed this concept. It's the first quote there. The triumph of the West, of the Western idea, is evident, first of all, in the total exhaustion of viable systematic alternatives to Western liberal, liberalism. In the past decade, there have been unmistakable changes in the intellectual climate of the world's two largest communist countries and the beginnings of significant reform movements in both. But this phenomenon ex extends beyond high politics and can be seen also in the ineluctable spread of consumerist Western culture in such diverse contexts as the peasants, markets, and color television sets now omnipresent throughout China, the cooperative restaurants and clothing stores opened in past year in Moscow, the Beethoven piped into Japanese department stores, and the rock music enjoy, enjoyed alike in Prague, Rangoon, and Tehran. What we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. This is not to say that there will no longer be events to fill the pages of foreign affairs yearly summaries of international relations, for the victory of liberalism has occurred primarily in the realm of ideas or consciousness and is yet incomplete in the real material world. But there are powerful reasons for believing that it is the ideal that will govern the material world in the long run. To understand how this is so, we must first consider some theoretical issues concerning the nature of historical change. 1989, history has come to a halt. <laughs> we know the perfect form of government, ours. <laughs> we know the perfect form of economy, ours. We know the perfect culture, ours. Sleep. Do not think. We are done. We don't have to worry anymore. We know the answer. It's all taken care of. Life is good. And we will continue on this glide path for eternity. <laughs> History has literally ended. Now this sounds silly. It was a best-selling book, by the way, like a massively best-selling book, cheered all over the world by people who you would think were literate, but were apparently not. Um, because if there is any single lesson from history, it is that history just keeps happening. <laughs> the sun never sets on the British Empire. This was at one time true. But notice this was also an ideological and a metaphorical claim. The British Empire is eternal. It is immortal. It will last as long as the sun. Or 
slightly less long. <laughs> the sun did, in fact, last longer than the British Empire. But fundamentally, our society believed this. I do believe it is now passing into the past tense, but it's been a slow awakening. We have been slumbrous, would be my central argument. Philosophy had no point, no use. What use does philosophy have when history has ended, when we've determined the perfect form of economy, culture, civilization, government? It's all worked out. Language, English, of course. Now, it's, like I said, I really truly believe that fundamentally, as a culture, we believed this. This is one thing to understand. It is not the end of history, because history never ended, but we thought it did. I would argue what's really ending is our belief that history ended, which is to say we are waking up to how it's always been. It's a very different sort of idea. So just to give you an example, I already said this, the sun never sets on the British Empire. This was literally true for a time. In 1910, the British Empire was the greatest empire the Earth had ever known by population, extent, ec economy, diversity, in every measure. In 1950, the British Empire was a third-rate collapsed economic power with no military might, no political cohesion, and almost economic irrelevance. 35 years, 40 years, from total dominance to historical afterthought. We think of England now only because we're, we share a language and we're used to thinking about them. We have cultural ties. 30 years, 40 years. Ah, but not us. No, no. <laughs> no, not us. Those other people, right? We're exceptional, American exceptionalism, right? This is the American century. <coughs> Although at the beginning of the American century, things weren't so peachy in America. In fact, in the middle of the American century, things weren't all that peachy in America. Nonetheless, we'll take it as our century. So then I thought, let's just come up with an incomplete list. This is just a partial list of large states and empires that have endured longer than the US and then failed. So in China, by the way, just in China, the Xi, now that's a question. There's some debate about whether that is a historical, there's some archeological evidence, yes, some archeological evidence, perhaps no, but we'll give them that one for about 400 years. The Shang, no question. For about 1,100 years, the Western Zhu, the Eastern Zhu, the Han Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, and the Qing Dynasty. They all lasted longer than the United States has lasted to date. And they're all gone. Here's some others. The Akhamen Dynasty of 220 years. Aksumites, 700 years. Armenian Empire, 600 years. Babylonian Empire, 300 years. Bulgarian Empire, 338 years. Caliphate of Cordoba, 275 years. Carthaginian, 500. Choa Dynasty, 500 or 15 to 1500, depending how you want to score, going up there in, this is in northern Korea. Uh, Khmer, 1629. Ottoman Empire, 1600, or 623 years. Parthian Empire, 470 years. Roman Empire, 503 years. You can go on. Byzant Byzantine Empire, depending on how you want to score, either like 1,800 years or at least four or 500. They're all gone. But not us. But not us. We're not subject to these historical forces because history has stopped. It's the end of history. Right after he wrote this in 1989, the Soviet Union collapsed. And this seemed to be the cherry on the whipped cream of the big Sunday of how awesome we are and the total triumph of the American way of life. 
because those bad people are gone and the good people have triumphed and we stood astride the world. They kept saying we're sole remaining superpower, China. <coughs> Sole remaining superpower in the world, right? Nobody else is out there. All bow before us. But we're nice. We just want to give you rock music and movies and democracy and all these good things. We're not like those other bad people. We're good people. And well, we've become immortal. Now this that triumphalism, if, if you live through this era, that triumphalism was just everywhere. It was, uh, you just couldn't escape it. And what was shocking to me was there was another way to read the collapse of the Soviet Union. Here was a great world-spanning culture, civilization, military and economic power that in just a few years collapsed and disappeared. Are we like them or are we unlike them? Statistically speaking, history suggests we're just like them. Someday, a year, 10 years, 100 years, if we're really lucky, five or 600 years, we too will unravel. Something will go wrong. Several things will go wrong. History will just come along and roll over us. Because this is what history has been doing, if you want to think of it as this outside force. But the strange concatenation of events that combine to bring America together as a place, and if you read American history, nothing is as unlikely as American history, and to thrust us up as the sole superpower in the world, thank you every other state for blowing yourselves up, that's unlikely to continue. Or some other equally bizarre arrangement of events will occur, and there will be. We'll join the list of failed historical empires and countries. It is absolutely <coughs> guaranteed to happen. We know this. Anyone who has ever read any history knows Eventually, it's going to fail. This is not unusual. This is totally normal. But we had convinced ourselves, we had been convinced, I am convinced at least, that this was not the case. We had been convinced that, no, we have arrived. And again, sleep, sleep, <laughs> relax. It's all taken care of. No need to think. No need to worry. We're good. By the way, both uh, Aristotle and to an even much greater degree, Plato, in a similar period of Athenian power and dominance and wealth, Plato argued that we, we can perfect government, the Republic of Plato, and in that republic, you really only need one or two philosophers. The reason you only need one or two philosophers or thinkers is because everything has been solved. Think of our love of technology. Once you've solved all of the big problems, economies, governing systems, tax systems, all that's solved. Well, then what you're really worried about is technology. Technology can take care of the rest, right? We're going to have technological progress within the framework of all of our cultural problems having been resolved. Yeah. So a brief history of the last couple of years suggests that, ooh, perhaps not quite perfectly resolved. 1991, as I mentioned, collapse of the Soviet Union. Major power fails, vanishes, and we think nothing to do with us. Right? Dot com crash, 1999, 2000. Stock market's booming, going wild, right? This is the economy we have, delivering wealth to the people. You invest, new technology, everything's great. Boop, gone. 
that's all right. That's just a little. Occasionally, there's these little, you know, corrections, right? These little, you know, subtle minor changes. And everybody goes, well, of course, we'll shrug that one off. 9-11 attacks in 2001, sort of a bit of a wake-up call, maybe. Invasion of Iraq in 2003. Now, I love the invasion of Iraq in a historical sense because that is where everybody always invades. <laughs> I don't know why you have to invade Iraq, but you do. It's Afghanistan and Iraq. You just have to invade them. The second you get a military, you think, Iraq. <laughs> Look at the history of the place. Everybody, I, I don't know. I, if, if Ecuador decided to take over the world tomorrow, for some reason they would go, let's start with Iraq. <laughs> if we can get the Tigris and Euphrates, we're in business. It, it, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But there we went. We invaded a country that had not attacked us, which is, which is odd <laughs> and different than we like to think. Then we had the Great Recession of 2008 through, you tell me when it ends. Um, you can't lose money in real estate. I heard this over and over, and I, I just, I, the history of real estate is a series of speculative bubbles followed by horrible collapses. Since they invented real estate, the next thing they invented was a speculative bubble. <laughs> this goes back to ancient Rome. This goes, I mean, it goes all the way back as long as we have records of these things. And yet newspapers, magazines, television shows, you all heard this, cocktail parties, right? Oh, you, gotta, you can't lose money in real estate. They're not making more. Right? It turns out it is, in fact, possible to lose money in real estate. In fact, it's impossible to watch the economy of the entire world halt. It came to a complete standstill. It was one of the most extraordinary events that I think we we're likely to ever see. Uh, you, can, you can look this up. This is, this is truly, they tried to pass a funding bill through Congress. And Congress turned it down because it had no oversight, it had no anything. And the markets plummeted and they called a second meeting. And the Treasury Secretary and the, uh, everybody was in there. And they said, look, here's the deal. Either you pass this money or in about 48 hours, nobody credit card will work. That's where we are. The credit markets are completely frozen. The economies will come to a complete halt. So they pass this just blank check, I forget, 800 billion, a trillion, huge, just here, here, have all the money you want. Make it go, make it go, which is not an unreasonable response, by the way. It was, we were, you know, it was, you know, major banks just disappeared. They vanished overnight. And so we changed, oh, that's right. We made no significant changes to the world financial markets. <laughs> right? It's okay. We're all right. Everything's fine. Sleep. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Every once in a while, the markets just cease functioning. That's okay, isn't it? That's cool. By the way, another detail from this that will give you an idea of how bad things were, GE, General Electric, one of the largest multinational corporations in the world, had no cash. They had to get an emergency loan from Warren Buffett to keep operating because no one would give them any money. Think about this. I mean, General Electric, they're not in a lot of debt. They're a good company. In theory, worth billions. In practice, for about two weeks, worth nothing. Because they couldn't get a loan. And Warren Buffett totally screwed them. But he got their money, right? So that, you know, that, that, that close. But now it's all fine. We fixed that somehow. And then we've had um, Brexit, right? Suggestion that the Eurozone projects may not be quite as stable 
and perfected as we might have hoped. And then we have our own contentious election. Strange, but strangely contentious. And notice whoever won this election, roughly half the country was going to be really upset. Like, really upset. And so we find ourselves in trouble, difficult, challenging, threatening, even fear-inducing times. Yes, good morning, hello. History has kept happening. In fact, it was happening the entire time. We had just somehow convinced ourselves culturally, our society had told us this repeatedly, that we were at the end of history. I think perhaps we are not. In fact, we never were. And so then what does one do when you find yourself not at the end of history? So the Athenians were not at the end of history either. Uh, first, they lost the Peloponnesian War. That's bad. Then they were overrun by the Macedonians. That's bad. And so their whole notion of the city-state, the sovereign, local, dem democratically controlled, gone. That dream died that they had perfected it, they had it under control. And so what did they do? One of the things they did is they produced three important philosophical schools. Stoicism, Epicureanism, Cynicism. Now they have their variations and they have their differences. But they all come to prominence at the same time because they're all trying to solve the same problem. I would say something like the problem that we now are beginning to face ourselves in an uncertain, unknowable world, in a world that has, in fact, not reached the end of history, what can an individual do? Now, I gave you just a little brief one. Zeno and the Stoics, the school taught that virtue, the highest good, is based on knowledge, and that the wise live in harmony with divine reason, govern nature, and are indifferent to the vicissitudes of fortune and to pleasure and pain. Virtue is the goal. Individual virtue. And then after that, indifference to fortune. Because the world out there is not ordered in any way that is meant for us. You can get hit by a bus, go bankrupt, something good, something bad. We can't control that, so you have to be indifferent to it. Not ignore it, you just can't allow it to affect you. Epicureans, the school rejected determinism, by the way, which is sort of what you get from the Stoics, and advocated hedonism, really, as pleasure as the highest good, but of a restrained kind. Mental pleasure was regarded as more highly than physical, and the ultimate pleasure was held to be freedom from anxiety and mental pain. You work to free yourself from anxiety. Not that any of us would be feeling that now. Because that is an important, they felt, one of the most important kinds of freedoms. Free yourself from fear, from anxiety, from stress, from worry about those forces over which you have no control. And then the cynics, uh, Crates and the cynics, it goes a little before him, but as a reasoning creature, people can gain happiness by rigorous training and by living in a way which is natural for themselves rejecting all conventional desires for wealth, power, sex, and fame. Instead, they will lead a simple life free from all possessions. Now, these are different schools, and they fought with each other, and they're crazy, but notice what they all have in common. The individual finds the resources within themselves. Reason, calmness, reflection, training indifference, pleasure, you out. This is not a coincidence. You design world-spanning systems when you feel like you control the world. When you realize you don't control the world, a very reasonable philosophical response is to ask, well, what can an individual do in a crazy, mixed-up world? It's a good question. It's a very philosophical question. But it's the same philosophical question no matter when and where you're born. We had just sort of forgotten that culturally. 
Um, this is why one of my favorite titles I've ever seen in a bookstore uh, was The Taoist Guide to Advancing Your Career. <laughs> I, I'm not making that up. Because when you've solved all the other problems, the only use philosophy has is for advancing your career in an otherwise perfect society. You can find Zen guides to improving your career. You can find Buddhist guides, Hindu guides to all this. In fact, that you know, contradicts every premise of these various philosophical and religious systems is beside the point. Because we solved all those ethical issues. So we begin to awake. We begin to awake to a world that really is not nearly as secure as we'd hoped it would be. Which is not that much fun, but on the other hand, better to be awake than asleep, perhaps. Philosophy says it is, but that's arguable. Well, that's, I will admit that's arguable. Generally, the philosophical idea is that it is better to be awake than asleep. It is better to know than to not know. Um, and so we're beginning to know Another aspect of it, I, I also have here the Enlightenment, um, just these easy definitions of it. European intellectual movement of the late 17th and 18th centuries, emphasizing reason and individualism rather than tradition. And then you Descartes, Locke, Newton, Kant, Goethe, Voltaire, Rousseau, Adam Smith, all famous people. We tend to think of this as an intellectual movement, which it was and is, a powerful one. But we forget that a lot of these people were imprisoned and jailed and had to flee, they fought, they were thrown out of jobs, and eventually you had the French Revolution, which you can kind of see as the, the, the apex of the Enlightenment. A war, a revolution, a continent on fire. Right? And we've inherited a lot of the Enlightenment ideals, but we're sort of the bastard children of the Enlightenment because we like the ideals, but we're not so happy about the fighting part of it. Right? At some point, we forgot that these things are not self-perpetuating. They aren't perfectly formed, and once they arrive, we just bask in the light of the Enlightenment and never have to worry about it again. <coughs> we might wish it were so. Eh, probably not so. In fact, definitely not so. History tells us absolutely, perfectly, clearly not so. So then how do we respond? How do I, what, you know, what, what do we do? How does, how does one respond? Uh, and on one hand, I don't know, but it's a good philosophical question. Here are some answers from philosophical history. One is to realize that one has to make choices in a grand scale. Jacques Barzon, who I mentioned in a previous lecture, talks about the difference between a classical age and a decadent age. In a classical age, people agree about what the general moral and ethical principles and guidelines of behavior are. It's not that they behave that way. They just agree that people ought to behave that way, regardless of how they actually do behave. So if you're familiar with Moliere, the French playwright, his plays are called mannerist plays because they make fun of the conventions of the society. And everybody thought they were hilarious. They are hilarious, by the way. They're just brilliant plays. But they work, and they work particularly well then, because everybody knew the conventions. They all agreed, agreed that this was hilarious. You could mock the conventions because everybody knew them. See, our conventions have broken down. And I'll give you just two examples that I think are very concrete for us. One, um, for the longest time, we've believed in religious freedom and individual liberty. This sounds great. They are great. What do you do when they come into conflict? You can't have them both all the time, it turns out. So currently, Europe is struggling with this in many particulars, but I think the clearest one is there is a branch of Islam. By the way, this is not Islam. This is a branch of Islam that argues that women are inferior and must be subjective to all kinds of restrictions, and limitations that are not placed on men. Now, they believe this sincerely. It is truly their religious belief. They're not lying. Their religious freedom requires that women be second-class citizens. Individual liberty says no. Women deserve equality. Great, what are you going to have? 
We hate this. We do not want to answer that question. We want to say all cultures are equal and deserve respect. Can't. Can't do it anymore. We suspended that problem for a long time. But the tides of history have changed. The inter interlacing of cultures has changed. The nature of Islam has changed. And now Europe's going to have to decide. We're going to have to decide. In the United States, we're starting to face these problems. What do you do? Which, which liberty is supposed to triumph? In a classical age, you know the answer to this. In our age, we do not know the answer. We have to decide, both individually and at a societal level. And when you have to fight these out, oh, it's difficult. Because both of these concepts are enshrined in our Constitution. It's not like one's not in there and the other is. That would make it easy. We go, oh, well, constitutional democracy, we have these courts, so you're going to go with the one that's in the Constitution, and we like the other one, but oh well. Nope. Both of them are in the rights of the of the European Union. Rats. And by the way, you're going to have to enforce them with physical force. Another thing we dislike. We don't want to have to fight for whatever it is we decide is valuable. We want it to have been decided and for everybody to play nice. The history of this is pretty clear. That doesn't work all the time. It works sometimes. It doesn't work all the time. And so right now, all over the world, this struggle is really on. But it has been going on. It's not like fundamentalist Muslims showed up in Europe yesterday, or the day before, or a month ago, or a year ago. Just for a while, we're able to paper it over for whatever reasons. And again, I want to repeat, this is not Islam. Islam and Europe have been together for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right? This is not, this is not it's, it's a flavor of Islam that has developed. And so, wow, what do we do about that? When two of our fundamental cherished principles come into conflict, ah, this is what wakes us up. We hate it because now we really have to think. We can't even fall back on our standard guidelines and go, oh, well, we have rules for deciding this, you know, the courts and all that. Again, this is, this is going to be contentious. Another way to think about this, uh, or uh, another example of this, is you go, we believe in private property, and we believe in an egalitarian society. And that dual belief is now coming into a very stark contrast. Because of massive accumulations of wealth by a very small group of people, and the interesting thing is, we tend to think that everybody else has been impoverished by this. Statistically, this is not true. We're not any poorer than we were 20, 50, 100 years ago. In fact, much richer than we were 100 years ago. But what, what's happened is when the top goes up so much, we feel relatively like we must be being impoverished. But at some point, it creates all of these social distortions and problems. And, 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 and we, don't, we just don't know how to respond because we believe in private property. Uh, this always cracks me up because they always talk about affordable housing. If you ever hear this phrase, it is a nonsensical phrase. It means nothing. It is, it is medieval casuistry at its finest. Affordable for whom? Under what circumstances? If you build affordable housing, everybody wants it. 
Because if I can pay less for reasonable quality housing than I'm paying now, why wouldn't I? That's just sensible. What we really mean is we're going to build some housing and we're going to choose some people and we're going to let them have it. But if you have a free market economy, then housing responds to market forces, more or less. And if market forces determine that everybody wants to live in some place like, say, Monterey, where your classic two-bedroom, one-bath house will go for a million, a million and a half, what the hell does affordable housing mean? Half a million dollars? Three quarters of a million dollars? Half the price you would pay? Or if you make a house available for, say, $100,000 in Monterey, why wouldn't everybody want that? And the second they had it, what would they do with it? Sell it for a million and a half dollars. Pocket the million four hundred thousand dollars and they're on their way. See, we say things like affordable housing because we think that's a good idea. It sounds like a good idea, but it's totally and utterly meaningless. Because if we actually dug in there and tried to think it out, we'd realize there's this fundamental tension between our theories of free market capitalism and private property and our notion that people should be able to afford to live in houses roughly in places where they work and where they might want to live. And when those concepts come, those concepts can't be reconciled, again, our first response is medieval casuistry, because that's why they were doing it in the medieval ages. That's why we do it in every age. You come up with sort of high sounding terms that really don't actually mean anything. <coughs> Because if you speak clearly and say poor people can't live here because it's too expensive, go away. Or some people are not going to be able to sell their houses for as much as they want because we do want poor people to live here. Too bad for you. Everybody's pissed off. If you want to make affordable housing, just say you can't sell a house for more than a quarter of a million dollars. There you go. That's the most expensive house in the United States. <coughs> Drive all the prices down everywhere. Solved. Of course, you would have just taken, you know, a trillion dollars or so of equity away from millions of people. They would be unhappy. Even people who have liked the idea of affordable housing would be very unhappy. Right? So this, this is what happens when our fundamental beliefs start conflicting with each other. Not with an outside belief, it's our beliefs that's in conflict. And now we have to start thinking. It shakes us up a bit. A couple of things to remember, though, as, as we do start thinking, which I said, one, again, I mentioned the, the Stoics, the Epicureans, and the Cynics because they did start thinking about it. Very hard. Really, really hard. Because they had to. So read some Stoics, some Epicureans, and some Cynics. Not a bad idea. Another thing is, is remember... What are we fearful of? I think many of us, I think it's true for myself, that, for instance, many beautiful things that we cherish may be destroyed and lost. History suggests that many beautiful things that we cherish will be destroyed and lost. I can guarantee that will happen. It's the nature of history. It's the nature of the passing of time. Ah, how do we respond to that? One way is to try and bring more beauty into the world. If you fear we're going to lose beauty, bring beauty into the world. If you feel joy and kindness is going to be crushed, bring joy and kindness into the world. Right? This is what the Epicureans were talking about. You feel like pleasure is being drawn out of the world? Bring some pleasure into the world, right? It's, 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 it's that, you know, it, don't, don't get rid of it. Don't say beauty is being extinguished, let's destroy beauty. Do the opposite. Right? If you feel like there's fear in the world, don't add to it. Do we need more fear in the world? Probably not. Right? This, is the, this is what the Stoics were talking about and the Cynics. You discipline yourself because the world doesn't need more fear. 
And if I'm adding my fear to the sum total of human fear, this is not helpful. But there's a lot of responsibility for me. This, when you read the Epicureans and the Stoics and the Cynics, and again, they disagree with all kinds of things. But you'll, you'll realize that this is what they're struggling with, with what we're struggling with. Uh, another aspect of this, and this is both our education system, what we've been told, uh, it's this weird double message. We've been wildly oversold how important we are and how powerful we are as individuals. You always look up at, at great people like Martin Luther King. I love Martin Luther King. He's a great man, but we're always told, you know, be like Martin Luther King. He's a historical anomaly. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was not the first nor the last person to refuse to obey the rules on the public bus. She was the one that, for whatever reason, history, social environment, that was the case. The one that we remember. So acting is important. Doing what you believe is important. But expecting that, oh, well, I did something and everything didn't change. See, this is, I think that's the message we get. We get oversold on our power. But I also think we get undersold in our power. Um, people like to talk about the news media and how good it is or bad it is, and this is a bad station, this is a bleh. Okay, fine. Um, one thing that's often overlooked is our news media is almost entirely national and or international in focus. Most of us cannot influence either national or international policy. It's not within our power. And so we feel powerless. Well, this is silly. Just because you can't affect international policy does not mean you're powerless. But because that's what we always see, that's what we're always shown, this matters. If you don't influence this, you don't matter. Well, of course you don't matter then. Of course I'm powerless. You're weak. No. If you reverse that and saw 90% of your news was local and regional, all of a sudden, oh, if I really want an issue I'm concerned about, I could go to a city council meeting, I could organize my friends, and we could fix the pothole on the road on our street. We can, you know, paint the school, we could get a dog park, we can clean up the beach, we could, there's any, you know, you could do all these things, and then you would feel powerful. Rosa Parks didn't shut down the bus system in the entire country. One bus, one place. Local. It was a local issue. It just happened to have a national ripple. Now, it could be that we go out and clean up a beach, and for some bizarre reason, this becomes a cause celeb, and all of a sudden, all the beaches in the world become contentious issues for cleanup. And history would look back and go, oh, well, those people there in Fort Townsend who cleaned up that beach <laughs> turned the tide of history. This is silly and wrong. Because people have been cleaning up beaches for a long time, and the people will hopefully continue to clean up beaches for a long time. So not being omnipotent or not being bestride the globe like you know these Goliaths does not mean you're powerless. In fact, this is one of the bizarre things coming from the United States. We so expect to be so immensely powerful in all things all the time that any check at all on the slightest capacity to do anything makes us think that, oh, it's either impossible or we've lost all power. Oh, how do you know? Think of all of the other small countries in the world that have to navigate this. And they don't have the world's largest military. They don't have the world's largest economy. And yet somehow they've got to swim through the same shoals of the international politics and, and economy and problems and recessions that we do, just without all of the guns and money. And lawyers, I guess. Send guns, lawyers, guns, and money, right? Isn't that the song? You know, this, this you know, but we feel, oh, we're so weak and powerless. Well, that's just silly. We have more access to education, knowledge, information, money, opportunity than any people ever in the history of the world. And yet, somehow, we've been convinced 
we feel ah, oh, there's nothing we can do or very little. And so this is again, if you read the Stoics, if you read the Epicureans, if you read the Cynics, this is one thing they talk. What can you do? Don't worry about the infinite number of things you can't do. Can't move the Andromeda galaxy closer. That would be cool. <laughs> you know, but what can I do? The, th those sorts of questions. Now we have to ask them, though. Well, we don't have to ask them. You never have to ask them. They've become less avoidable. How about that? Suddenly they've become less avoidable. Things that we've taken for granted all of a sudden, ooh, not so much for granted. And so as we begin to grapple with this, you know, try and you know, take a few steps back. Look at the span of history. And remember that when the Roman Empire was collapsing, people just like us lived there. They loved their children. They liked their gardens. They had hopes for the future. They wanted to see their sons educated, not so much their daughters, I'm sorry, but their sons, at least. <laughs> now we would like to see our sons and daughters educated. But the future was uncertain. But the future was uncertain just like it's always been. This is not a reason for despair, nor a reason for fear. But now that we've woken up, I would say, to the notion that history is not ended, it is a bit scary, perhaps. All right, but then how do we respond? So again, as I mentioned, one, think beauty. Think courage. Next subject, next time, courage. We'll be talking a lot about the Stoics, Cynics, and Epicureans, because they, they were big on this. Um, but the one I'd like to leave you with is think the consolations of philosophy. I just can't pass this up. It's so obvious. <laughs> it's a work by Boethius, who was sort of the, either the last great Roman thinker or the first great non-Roman thinker. It's hardly hard. He was right there on the transition. And he had it all. He had everything, wealth, power. He was patronized by one of the most powerful kings of his age position, he was an advisor, and then and for years, he was, it was a long run, respected as probably the most knowledgeable scholarly man of his era, and then one day court intrigues and politics happened, there was this notion that he was conspiring against the king, and so he was imprisoned, he was going to be tortured, and then killed. And so while he was in prison, he thought, wow. That was a bad turn. <laughs> what can I make of this? And he wrote a dialogue, Boethius's Consolations of Philosophy, in which Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, comes to pay him a visit. And they have this long argument in which he says, essentially, woe is me. And she says, now hold on a second. And they go back and forth. And, and I actually, one of, one of the nice things about this dialogue is basically you feel with Boethius. I feel for Boethius. I mean, really, he is in a bad spot. He's not just whining. He's not like, my internet is slow. <laughs> it's not streaming at all. Right? This is not what his complaint. His complaint is, I've lost everything, and they're about to torture me to death. And so in that, even in that environment, OK, what can we say? And Sophia basically says, very close to the Stoic line, um, says, look, all of that was vanity. Who you are is in you. Right? What you make of yourself, and what you make of yourself right to the end. This hasn't stopped. This isn't a project that you had completed. End of history. He thought he had arrived. Not quite. Right? He didn't He's sort of one of the messages, not the only one, by the way. It's a very rich, mixed, crazy dialogue. Uh, but part of it was this notion of, look, you, you, you're not done. Right? If you, you know, this notion that we feel like we've arrived. Oh, now I've arrived. Now I'm finished. Now I know. Now I'm clear. And then you get up in the morning, and we've all had this experience, right? Well, I've, I think I've, I've got it kind of worked out. And then you realize, ah, I don't have it worked out. 
right? Something. I, my, my brother-in-law, I don't think he'll mind me telling the story on him, but he was 25, he'd just gotten out of graduate school, he traveled with Europe with a friend of his, and he said, oh, I think I'm really, you know, I've got my hand on, I've got it, I've got it, I'm done, there, good. Then he got this girlfriend. <laughs> and it all fell apart, which was hilarious, because that's what happens, right? Uh, uh, when we think we've got it, and then something happens, and all, but that, by the way, should always happen. Because part of the notion of the end of history is the only way history can end is if you get what's called the last man, or person. Let's say person now. It's a couple hundred years later. You get the last person. History ends when people all come to the same realization that they fundamentally agree on everything that's fundamentally important and they stop growing and changing. It's the end of them as well. And so when we start waking up to history, we should also be waking up to ourselves. Where did I stop? When did I stop learning and changing, or at least think I had stopped learning and changing? Why would I think that every other living thing expands and grows and changes and develops? but not me, that I finished, it's done. Hopefully you're not done. We don't want to be done. We want to start thinking about how is it that I can continue to grow and change and alter as my environment changes around me. Take any, any tree. As it grows, the bark cracks. If you put, if the light gets shaded on one side, the leaves will all fall off and it'll lean towards the light. And then you, if the light changes again and there's more light on the other side, well, it'll leaf out over there again and new branches will grow. And this will go until the tree dies. Right? That, that, that change, that growth, that breaking, if that's not happening, that should be the warning sign. When we think we don't need to crack, we don't need to bend, we don't need to reach for the light, literalizing the enlightenment, right? That when, when, that's not, when that's supposed to be effortless, ooh, that's what should worry us. And so I guess the, the, this, if I have a message from the end of history is that, of course, history hasn't ended, thank goodness. Thank goodness. If history ends, where's, there's no room for us to create, to be great to respond, to grow, to meet our challenges and overcome them, to contribute, to make new again. One way to understand the romantic movement, uh, there's all kinds of definitions and everything, but one way to understand it is to say, look, they felt constrained by a world and so what they wanted to do was knock it down so they could build anew. They had the drive to make it new. Now, we may not want to do this, but if we don't have a choice, at least we have that opportunity. What do we want to do? What do we want to salvage? What do we want to protect? What do we want to make new? How do we think the world should be? And what part do I have in it? These are all the most profound philosophical questions you can ask. And there's, you know, a thousand answers from the history of philosophy just to confuse you. But it, the asking of them is the beginning. It's when we don't ask that we're really in trouble. Because then we're just, you know, sleepwalking through history, as they call it. Because history didn't stop. So, uh, to leave you with a cheery note, I guess, <laughs> if, if, if I don't know, I, I, if, if, you know, this is, this is our opportunity. Right? This is the, the chance. People look back at the 60s and say, oh, it was great back then. They had you know opportunity to go out. No, they didn't think it was great. They didn't think, well, boy, the Vietnam War, yay, something to protest. But they thought, well, this is worth protesting. And in retrospect, it seems great. It was great that they did. Perhaps vital. Maybe we're, this is where we're going again. But the only person who can decide all this, of course, is you. It puts the burden back on the individual. 
to decide what can I do? A very difficult question. What do I wish to do? How do I wish my world to be? What would I like to see happen going forward? How can I contribute to that? Uh, you know, it's, 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 these are all, like I said, these are the most fundamental philosophical questions you can ask, but you're not going to get answers if you don't ask them. And I mentioned this on health before. Um, and, and thinking about the media and all this in the national sense, one, one thing to ask about this is, okay, if I ask these questions, where can I find answers? Evening news, not so much. <laughs> I've yet to see a broadcast that says, hey, Wes, here's some answers to your philosophical questions. We're going to lead off with the news tonight. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the, the news is ipso facto evil. It just means it's potentially a distraction from your questions. And if you continually, it's the, it's the, it's the great quote from uh, Mullah Nasruddin, who's sitting on the, on the side of the road, and this guy comes running, running up the road, cloud of dust behind him. And then he stops and says, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. He says, yeah. He says, how far is Baghdad from here? He says, well, it's about a 10-day walk. And the guy says, well, I'm running, so I'm going to make it in five. And he takes off down the road. And as he watches them disappear in a cloud of dust, the little desert and goes, huh, Baghdad's the other way. <laughs> <laughs> right? <coughs> so, it, you know, doing things that don't help you, don't help you. Doing things that, that uh, you know, don't enrich you, make you feel healthier, and make you feel more powerful, make you feel less powerful, less rich, and less healthy. And that doesn't help, unless you think less powerful, less healthy, less rich people is what the world is short of. I'm suspicious of that claim, but okay, you can argue it if you will. You know, so this is the concept to begin thinking. It's not unlinked, like I said, to, to the health one last time, or to the friendship one. Who are the people that I surround myself with? Do they make me feel better, more uplifted, more powerful, more capable? Do they help me examine myself? Do they challenge me? Or do they just exhaust me and drag me down, make me feel more scared, more unhealthy? Yeah, we, that, those are tough questions. But again, I do believe that since history hasn't ended, what we're waking up to is the fundamental philosophical question. And I can honestly say, in my experience, 15 years ago, philosophy dead, dead letter. All of a sudden, philosophical interest. It's not a coincidence. It's happening in any number of ways. Uh, it's because we are waking up to the fundamental questions, which, I mean, maybe it's better to sleep, but I don't know. I think it's better to be awake. So not the end of history, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.